Hello, welcome to today's webinar with Tuva, where we're going to talk about using Tuva to dive into engaging three dimensional science for middle school and high school students. So what is Tuva, right? Let's just sort of take a step back and make sure we're kind of centered into today's webinar in Tuva, right? So Tuva is this incredible math and science instructional program for students in grades three to 12 that brings real world, authentic, engaging learning into our everyday instruction in a variety of different ways. So today we'll be talking about what we'll be going through is we'll kick things off with a prompt to get thinking about where we're at with our science instruction. We'll think about the big picture of what Tuva provides for us while we're teaching our students science across the middle school and high school ages. I'll demonstrate a couple of different ways that we can leverage Tuva and the data within Tuva to really assist our student science learning. We'll talk through some resources to help get started when teaching science with Tuva and then talk about some next steps. So I encourage you to pause and reflect on some of these questions. What aspects of these science and engineering practices and or our cross cutting concepts do your students struggle with the most or what science phenomena are often the hardest to teach to students, the, the ones that they struggle with a lot? And what strategies are you using now to make science more relevant, real world, and engaging for your learners? Be that if we're in person or hybrid or if we're remote learning, how are we really engaging our students in this learning of science? So I encourage you to pause and reflect on those and then keep go coming along. So what Tuva provides for science is that it enables our science learning for our students in engaging ways where they're actually doing the science directly, right? We're not passively absorbing information or facts, but we're actively manipulating and making decisions along the way that enhance our learning and understanding of the concepts while at the same time building these science and engineering practices and a better sense, a sort of more integrated sense of what those cross-cutting concepts are. And the way that we do that within Tuva are that the tools have been designed to help students understand how to use different graph types to their advantage as they're making sense of data and making sense of the phenomenon that they're looking at, as well as how to analyze those data to really make sense, right? To, to find our claim from the data, but beyond that sort of, what does that tell us about the broader phenomenon that we're investigating? So Tuva has a wide variety of opportunities for science with over 225 science data sets, 150 activities that have been specifically developed to teach different concepts or different components of our, of our science content that we're trying to get across. So the activities are built out to be, to fit into a lesson structure, sort of here is a lesson on a topic that we're covering as well as we have over 25 data stories, which are built out as little nuggets, sort of do nows, opportunities to get our students hooked or interested or applying their knowledge, their science knowledge in ways that are helping them practice these practices of science through using data and building their data skills. So I just wanna briefly kind of give you an overview sense of what's included in, you know, across all these data sets activities is the way that you can find them. So they're organized by grade level, they're organized by subject or topic area. And, and we also identify what are local or regional topics. So if you're looking for a data set or an activity related to where you are specifically, that's a great way to go in and find a data set as well as data set properties. So is this a spatial data set? Can I use this to help my students get a sense of spatial reasoning or get at a phenomenon from a spatial perspective? And similarly, time series, so to get at it from a temporal perspective. So what does this actually look like? So when you sign into Tuva, you'll arrive at your dashboard. It will look something similar to this, right? But not exactly the same because you will have different classes than I do. And the first thing you want to do is click over to the content library. This is the best go to place to find things. And we've created, we've restructured this. So it's really easy to narrow in on, I want to find specific science data sets. So along the left hand side, you can see different ways to filter the data like I was just talking about. So by grade band, if you're a middle school science teacher, you're like, 
it's great to know what they're doing above and below, but really I need something for my middle school students. So you can immediately sort of filter out the ones that aren't relevant to your middle, to your middle school grade level. What if you're interested in a specific performance expectation and you're looking to see like, what does Tuva have that I could use for MS LS 1, 2, right? So you can filter the data, you can filter this content library to get you information that just hits on that performance expectation that you might be interested in looking at. Similarly, as I was talking about, we have our activities, the data stories, and the data sets. And so if you have an idea of what kind of interaction you're looking for for your students, you can quickly come through and say, actually, you know what, I'm looking for a data story that I can use um, or an activity that I can use with my middle school students. What's really nice is that there's a, a mark of when new things have gone up live on the site, there's constantly new content being added into the system. Um, and you can easily pull that out and get a sense of what's going on. So that gives you a bit of an overview of how to search and filter for content that's specifically related to science and or the, um, the grade level or the topic that you're looking at as a way to kind of filter down all of this content, all the science content that Tuva has to make it relevant for your topic area. And really what we're looking to do, right, is by creating a structure that's easy to find that content for you, what we're hoping to do is that it's easier and um, it's easier for you and more accessible for your students to actively get doing the science, right? To be able to utilize these and leverage these instructional resources, these opportunities that Tuva provides into your science teaching so that the students are working on these practices, they're applying the cross-cutting concepts in ways that are relevant to them and that, that are exciting. And because a lot of this comes down to there are so many phenomena in the world that we just can't collect our own data on or that we just can't really wrap our heads around without actually looking at data. And so this is what we're trying to provide, the sort of opportunity for students to be able to do, have real world engagement that's relevant so that they can authentically work through these concepts, through these different topic areas that we're helping them explore and understand as they're making sense of the world around them. So what I want to do is I want to demonstrate a few of our active, you know, a few ways that we can leverage Tuva and all that Tuva has to offer into our science instruction. So let's say you're a middle school science teacher and you know coming up in your next unit, you'll be trying to cover the performance expectation of PS3-1, where we're, where we're trying to support our students in constructing and interpreting graphical displays of data to describe the relationships between kinetic energy to the mass of an object or to the speed of an object, right? This is a performance expectation. It's large, but one question we could, our students could ask to get at this is, how does kinetic energy change with speed? So how could we get at that? Here's a data set that was looking at NFL football helmets, the physics of our of football helmets. And one thing that we can do is we can look at our impact velocity. So that's the speed um, or the, the force, the energy that's coming in. And we could look at the change in velocity, sort of the speed that results from that. I'm gonna move this to the side. We'll talk about that panel in a little bit. And so now we, you know, we've graphed some data of our energy and of our speed, and we can start to play around with this to get a sense of like, what's actually going on? And our students can informally try to make sense of these data by creating a movable line, trying to fit that line to the data to get a sense to provide that visual cue of what is the relationship between these two variables. If you want to take it a step further, we can add a least squares line to see actually what is the fit of the relationship of these data. What's great is that we can plot it so we can have that visual cue, but we can also know what the equation is. We can get at the y equals mx plus b that they're learning in their math classrooms, but how we apply it in our science to make sense of these two variables that are coming together. And so each of these lines have an equation that can come through 
as well as we can look in our summary view to get a sense of what our different characteristics are. And so what's interesting is we look at this and we can see, okay, there's, there's a positive relationship between, you know, or between these two variables, these two attributes, they are correlated with one another, but it seems like there's some interesting clumping going on. So we can explore the data one step further. We can continue that inquiry and diving into what's going on. And so what we could do is we could get a sense of like, does the impact location maybe impact what's going on? And by plotting those, we can see, oh, like this clump at the bottom seems to all be coming from our rear impact for on the helmets within the NFL. And whereas the temple impact or side impact or front impact are all clustered up here with higher changes in speed and higher energy going in. It's interesting, right? This is a way that we can kind of continue our students understanding so that they're getting at that initial question of um, there is a correlation there's this positive relationship between the impact velocity and our speed of the player's head at at impact on the nfl helmets but we can also dive deeper into that understanding by using the the interactive interface of tuva so let's explore another example still staying with with middle school for the moment let's dive into this to atmospheric part, atmospheric changes and there are a variety of different performance expectations that can get at this but maybe you're looking to get at the ess32 of analyze and interpret data on natural hazards to forecast future catastrophic events and inform the development of technologies to mitigate their effects. So different questions that we might have that can start to get at this are, are hurricanes becoming stronger? Like if this is a natural hazard, a hurricane, and if their strength is increasing over time, we need to know that as we're forecasting forward. Or is carbon dioxide the same in different locations, right? We know atmospheric carbon dioxide is changing um, and that that has impacts on the, the climate and the weather in various places, but is that the same everywhere? And that has important implications for our forecasting. And so we could we can look at those. We can also ask questions related to ESS 3.5, where we're asking questions to clarify evidence of factors that have caused the rise in global temperatures over the past century. So for example, how is atmospheric carbon dioxide changing over time? So we can use some of these data sets to dive in and get a better sense. And so to looking at that first question of are hurricanes getting stronger, we could take a look and see, okay, so we want to look at them over time. So we'll plot the start date along the X axis. And then you know, we don't have sort of one way of calculating strength, but we could use max wind speed, given that the maximum wind speed is what distinguishes a hurricane from a tropical storm and a tropical depression. And so we could use that as a proxy of strength to get a sense of this, to start answering these questions. And then we could, you know, go back and add our least squares line and get a sense of, are things changing? These hurricanes happened over time. What's going on? Okay, it does seem to be that there's sort of not really much of a relationship or a sort of small decrease of a relationship within this data set. So from the early 2000s, around 2002, till about 2018, within this data set of these hurricanes that have come through, of these tropical storms that have come through, what's going on? But then we could look over here and we could say, hmm, storm type. What, what different kinds of storm types do we have? Oh, wait, our question was only about hurricanes. And so we can dive deeper into the data, pull out those other types of storms, again, that are differentiated by their maximum wind speed. And now we're look at it again and we're like, okay, it's not, doesn't seem to be increasing. In fact, it seems to be even more slightly decreasing than the full data set overall. So we could look here, we can sort of explore, we can play around. Let's, let's think about some of those other natural hazards that we were talking about. Like does carbon dioxide, the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide, does that vary by, um, vary by location? And so one thing we can do is we're interested in looking at location. So we can get a sense of what's, what are our options within this data set? Okay, so we've got um, 
Canada, we've got Hawaii with Mauna Loa, and we've got the South Pole in Antarctica. Okay, we've got a little bit of difference in the number of data points that we have across each of these three locations. But what we're really interested in is, is the carbon dioxide. What's going on with the amount of carbon dioxide in these different locations that are in three pretty, you know, so Hawaii and Canada are both in the Northern Hemisphere, but they're still remarkably different in terms of latitude. And then we've got the South Pole. So we've got three really different locations around the world and sort of what's going on. This is a lot of data points. It's hard to make sense of that. So we could put it into a box plot that five way, um, five way of summarizing our data that our students are learning in their math classrooms. And we could see sort of, oh, okay, looking at this, they're actually quite similar across these different, these different locations. Um, so here we have, we've been able to get in and look at the data and for ourselves figure out that atmospheric carbon dioxide is pretty consistent across the globe. And so we could use Mauna Loa to do our next activity of moving forward. So let's, let's do that next activity. Let's look at, so we've moved through here. We've gotten a sense that our carbon dioxide is pretty similar across different regions, but let's get a sense of how is carbon dioxide changing over time, right? That was another one of our questions for a different performance expectation. So we'll come back in, we'll look at date, we'll look at carbon dioxide, we'll get a sense of what's going on. There are lots of data points and then we remember, oh wait, wait, there's multiple locations in this data set. So let's actually, and we just figured out that they're similar across. So let's pull out everything but the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii and look at the data from there. So what we can do is we can add a reference line to get a sense of like, well, where did we cross 400 parts per million within the data set? And then we can, you know, this gives a visual cue for a baseline. We can also go in and we could add another reference line to help our students make sense of like, okay, so when was it that we crossed this threshold of 400 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And it was in about 2015. And so by adding these extra annotations and interactive pieces, we can take a graph that we, rather than it being static, our students can interact with it as they're making sense of carbon dioxide has been increasing over time and we've passed a threshold um, where we're, you know, passed a threshold a few years ago and where we're going from here. The interesting thing is that we can also use this data set to get at some of our high school performance expectations as well. And so here, one of our, you know, let's transition out of middle school science hat into a high school life science teacher or in our classroom. And we're one of our expectations, LS25, is to develop a model to illustrate the role of photosynthesis and cellular respiration in the cycling of carbon among the biosphere, hydrosphere, and geosphere. This is great, right? There's lots of great diagrams and models that we can do, but we can also leverage data to build out and enhance our students' understanding of this concept. And we can do it using that data set we were just looking at, right? We can have this driving question of like, we're, you know, we've seen this graph of atmospheric carbon dioxide, it's going up over time, but it seems to have this wiggle. And our question could be like, why does carbon dioxide seem to rise and fall seasonally in the atmosphere. So I'm just gonna take away these reference lines because that's not relevant to our question right now. These are a lot of data that are going up and down. And so we can come in and we can actually limit the amount of data that we're looking for. So I'm just gonna limit it to six years here just to give us a broader sense. It could be any portion of the data set that you wanna do. And you're like, okay, so now we're narrowing in. There seems to be this sort of remarkably consistent up and down cycle that we're seeing within our data. And we could get a sense of like, well, the question had us think about seasonally that it was rising and falling. So we could plot the seasons to get a sense of what's, you know, which of these data points are from what season. And then we can start to see, oh, interesting, the sort of rise to the peak is always in the pink, it's always in the spring. This downfall is always in the summer, these summer months. And then this helps us. And if you actually want to know, you know, kind of what months they are, we can click on the data points and we can look and say, OK, that point was from May. Oh, interesting. This point was from May as well in 1960. 
This point was from May as well in 1963. So we can interact and get a sense of there's a clear, not only is there a clear cyclical pattern, but there's consistency across this pattern, which can help us get to the understanding of, so atmospheric CO2 rises through the winter and the spring seasons, and it falls in the summer, which we can then connect back to our understanding of there aren't many leaves out or our leaves are just aren't many leaves out in the winter they're just budding out in the spring but as we have lots of leaves and lots of plant, plant growth in the summer right the growing season in the northern hemisphere our atmospheric co2 decreases right because of photosynthesis so this is a way to see to get at that concept of like how does that actually apply like why where do we see that in the natural world of across these different systems so we can pull the concept of photosynthesis and respiration out into the broader perspective by leveraging the data in this way i do want to come back to think about sort of what's going on in this awesome right panel on the side. Um, so this A inside of a gear indicates that questions within an activity, these are where our activities live that are relevant to any particular data set. This A means that it's automatically graded for you. If you click on the title, you can get an overview preview of what the learning objectives are and what the intention of the activity is. You can also get a sense of what the supporting documents are. These, these teacher guides, these data set guides are sort of a way to help you into the data set to get a better sense of how to, how to move forward with that or, and or how to facilitate this activity, like what's going on. So you can look at what are the actual questions that our students would be stepping through, as well as all the different ways that this activity is tagged. You can also look at it by previewing it exactly how your students would step through the activity. Um, so there's multiple different ways that you can get a sense of what are these 220 different data sets that we have, as well as like 150 activities that are science related, you can take a look at them before you assign them to your students. There's one more example that I wanna provide because um, I think it gets at this really hard concept to somebody sometimes provide for our students. And it's a great example of how having data can help the sort of microscopic, you, we've moved from the, you know, hugely macroscopic of atmospheric carbon dioxide into this, you know, totally microscopic understanding the concept phenomenon of genes and gene expression and chromosomes. So continuing on, we're in life science, we're trying to get at LS31, where we're developing and using a model to describe why structural changes to genes or mutations located on chromosomes may affect proteins and may result in harmful, beneficial, or neutral effects to the structure and function of an organism. And there's a wide variety of ways that we can get at this performance expectation, right? But one way to augment our students' understanding is that we could use some data and have them look at these relationships between the genes and these mutations and what those effects are and what's happening. So some questions we could ask are, how are the number of the copies of the AMY gene going, um, it, that individuals have, how's that related to the amylase production in saliva? Or how has an environmental factor in terms of the diet of an individual affected the genes in a population? So let's dive in and take a look at this. So we're looking at, we're sort of interested in how many copies of this gene that show up on chromosome one there are in an individual, and then how that relates to how the protein is synthesized, like how much protein we actually see in the saliva. And so again, it looks like we've got a pretty tight relationship here. We can add our least squares line to get a sense of what actually is that relationship between the number of copies and the amount of protein to get a sense of as the copies increases, the amount of protein increases. So as there are more genes, more sort of spots on chromosome one, where this gene shows up, we're actually seeing a higher production of amylase within saliva. We could also then think, a look, think about that second question of, so what are some environmental impacts or that could be interacting with this, uh, with this system? So again, we'll look at how many copies are there of the gene on chromosome one, 
And then we'll take a look at across this environmental factor, the diet that individuals might had. So we can kind of get a see, a, get a sense of what's going on in the data. Let's change it up to a histogram to get sort of a better sense of what's going on. And we can start to see that there's a bit of a difference in the shape of these two graphs. Like they're both relatively normal distributions, but this low seems to be more skewed towards the left. We can also get a sense of what are the, how did the means vary in terms of the number of copies of this gene on chromosome one. And it's kind of hard to get a sense of that. You know, we can visually see that, but we can also add our, add our label to get a sense. So, so that's the mean. We know means are really sensitive to far outside points. So we could also add our median to get a sense of kind of what's going on with this as well. So between the graph type and these summary statistics that we can add, we can start to sort of dive in and get a better sense of like, oh, the, there seem to be a higher, consistently higher number of copies of this on folks that are eating high starch diets, right? The tendency is for more copies of the gene with high starch diets than with low starch diets. So it's a way to take this concept of how do how does DNA coding and expression of traits and play play in on itself in ways that we can actually see within our population or within an individual or the results of a test that we might run. So we can get at these different performance expectations by exploring the data, by diving in through guided questions or more open questions for our students that gets them interacting with more than just sort of a static usage of, of the data to help them follow their inquiry, follow their interest and deepen that, that understanding that they might have. I do want to point out some resources to help you get started. Um, or if you have any questions. So the tutorials um, are always a great place to look in terms of questions about how to interface with the activity um, or interface with the features and the tools that Tuva has within the app. But also want to highlight here this quick start guide for the next generation science standards where we've identified different activities and data sets and data stories that are great places to start based on the different topic areas that, that you're looking to cover. So there's a wide variety of options that are out there for you um, with Tuva, with the platform, with all these instructional resources that this instructional platform provides to leverage within the science class. I encourage you to pause and think about what one or two things might you take away from watching this that you can apply to your science instruction in the next week or the next month. Like, How can you start leveraging these activities and these data sets to help your students broaden and deepen their understanding of these science concepts? And as always, if there's anything that Tuva can do to help you in whatever instructional situation you're in right now, be it in-person, hybrid, or remote learning, feel free to reach out to me or to hello at tuva.com. We're happy to help in whatever ways that we can. And with that, thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.